Today we get to see angels as Isaiah saw them as he communicates his vision to us. It's the beginning of his ministry. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Henry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, taking you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation all in one year. We did that 30, this is our 31st times of the year. Next year we'll do it again, but this is very interesting. Corey? Well, the prophet Isaiah often grounds his prophecies to the reignal years of certain kings of Jerusalem. So today you and I are focusing in on King Uzziah. Ryan? Today, my focus is on Isaiah 6, 1, which says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The train of his robe? Yeah. More on that later. Very good. Look forward to that. Corey or uh, Janice? Called to serve is my segment today. All right. Very good. So get your Bible out, open it up, and let's look at Isaiah 6. What is God telling us? Let's find out. Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 10. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. You know, Isaiah is an amazing book. It truly is. The first six chapters um, are incredible. And then what happens is we get into chapter eight and that gets really interesting. Our reading assignment today, according to the Bible guide, is chapters six through eight of Isaiah. And I wanna tell you that if you don't have it, you should get it. The vision of Isaiah is remarkably stunning. It changes the way we see God's work and helps us to understand the holiness of his presence. Isaiah says, he sees other creatures in heaven. This is true. We're going to talk about it today. And he watches the work in God's plan. What? The world's happening. An incredible thing is to remember these angels and this work continues and it continues even today. If we believe in the Lord God and Jesus Christ and call ourselves Christians, we know that God continues to work in all of time, including today. Now, the visions of Isaiah are the visions of today also. With that in mind, we take these things seriously. We must acknowledge that the image God reveals in Isaiah's time are not only for his time, but they are for ours. Now, if you don't have the Bible guide, why not? Write for your Bible guide today. It's on the screen, the address and the phone number, or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. 
When you go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, click on the page. It'll take you to the donate page. Thank you for your donations. And then it'll take you to a page where you can download the PDF files of the Bible Guide as it's printed. Many things in the Bible Guide that we don't teach on, but they're there to help you understand what God is saying. Today, the vision. I want to tell you something. This is absolutely stunning and it's fascinating. And Father, I pray today as we consider what you've said, we look at what you've accomplished here and you've given throughout all of time. This is free to read for anybody. And I pray, Father, that as we read it, those are, there are many governments trying to take it away from people, but Lord, it's free. You can get it on the internet. You can get it anywhere. It's the most published book in the world. But I pray, Lord, that we would hear what you're doing and what you're saying. Thank you, Father, for everything that you have taught us through the word of God. Now that we're in Isaiah, we need to listen to you very carefully. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. You know, listening to God is important. Did you know that listening to God is the most important thing we will ever do? A lot of people say, well, I listen to my friends. I listen to my mom. I listen. listen to God. That's the most important thing. The scripture says in Isaiah 6, a key pivotal chapter. Listen to this. This is what he says in the first two. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Very important. The Lord is sitting on a throne. He is high. He is lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. That's interesting. Seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. Fascinating. Now, the angel's wings forms the shape of a cross. I don't understand why. I do understand why, because the cross shows up 800 years later. But the angel revealed the truth about what was to come in the future. Remember that... When we talk about God and when we talk about what he's prophesied, he speaks to all of time. To God, time is like my hand here. The beginning of time and the end of time. It's a created thing. It's a finite and it's a limited time. That's why God says he exists in eternity because eternity is everywhere and you can't really show it on your hand. But this is time and God speaks here, but he's also speaking here and here and here. God speaks here, but he's also speaking here, here and here. This is how God speaks. He speaks to us, beloved, so that we can know the truth about what he said and the truth about time. Now, this gets interesting as we study the angels. Let's read on six, three. And one cried to another and said, here's what they said. Holy, holy. Holy, three times, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. Isaiah begins to cry because when we see the holiness of God, beloved, we realize our unworthiness. When we see the holiness of God, we realize our unworthiness. But God allows our existence because he's doing something unique. God allows us to exist in his presence because he's doing something unique. Beloved, that is so important. We are focused on the time in which we live, but keep in mind that God is still holy. In the midst of the pandemic, God is and was and always will be holy. The, nothing affects God. Nothing affects God. In fact, he heals people and he changes things. When we ask him, when we talk to him, he grows us out. Beloved, that's the way God works. A lot of people like to see instant change, but that's not how God works. 
Now we go to the last part of the scripture, which is interesting, six through 10. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and tell his people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. The inspiration of God's word is divine. The inspiration of God's word is divine. The Bible was formed and written by the Holy Spirit who motivated man. Beloved, the word of God is written by the Holy Spirit. The 66 book by the 40 authors, 1500 years, yet it all has the same theme, Jesus Christ. I will say that till I'm dead. And I'll be saying that on into eternity as well. Because the Bible is the written word of God and it tells us the truth. And Father, today I come to you and I say, Lord, teach me your word. Teach me your word, Father. Teach me your word. I'm going to read it the rest of my life. Whatever it takes, Lord, teach me your word. In Jesus' wonderful and glorious name. And this is what we pray and we said together, amen. So I already had like the facade of evolution kind of broken down. Like I was very open to the concept that perhaps God existed because I could see the flaws in evolution. And he talked about God's law and sin. And you know, I, I believe these things. I don't even know why I believe them from an atheistic position, but I did believe you shouldn't lie. The prophet Isaiah, at the beginning of his recorded book, lists for us the different kings of Jerusalem during whose reigns he prophesied. And he lists them as Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. But we learn in our reading today in Isaiah chapter 6 that Isaiah actually receives his commission as a prophet the year that King Uzziah died. So he's living alongside King Uzziah and the co-reigning king, which we're going to learn about, Jotham, uh, and receives his commission at this transition of power officially. Let's focus in on King Uzziah's reign and we can talk about it a little bit afterwards. King Uzziah is called by two names in the Bible, Azariah in 2 Kings and Uzziah in 2 Chronicles. Uzziah began his reign when he was 16 years old and managed to keep the throne until his death 52 years later. This was in breaking with recent family tradition. Both his father Amaziah and his grandfather Jehoash were murdered by some of their own officials. Uzziah ruled Judah and Jerusalem in a sort of golden age of peace for the area. Both Judah and northern Israel benefited from the empire of Assyria being preoccupied with other nations to the north of them. Israel and Judah were also at a temporary peace with one another, and so King Uzziah had much time to expand his nation. The Bible gives him credit for great warfare, taking and rebuilding Eloth in the territory of Edom taking three Philistinian cities and building his own cities in their territories, and turning the Ammonite people into vassals of Judah. Credit is also given him for being industrious. He built fortified towers on the walls of Jerusalem, built military towers in the desert, and made use of war machines said to be placed in the towers to shoot arrows and large stones. Uzziah also reorganized Judah's military and supplied them with armor and equipment. Apart from military concerns, King Uzziah is said to have loved the soil, commissioning farmers and vine dressers in the mountainous areas of Judah and digging many new wells for his large amounts of herd animals. All of this taken together apparently made him famous as far as the entrance to Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. While it was this strength that would corrupt Uzziah's motivations, his life has left an archaeological record. 
seal impressions that mention him by name have been found. They originally belonged to two of his court officials. A gravestone warning people of Uzziah's leprosy has also been found. Though dated to a later time than his, it's believed that his bones were moved from his original tomb, and the ominous gravestone marked their new resting place. So it's interesting that Isaiah would have lived through at least part of the reign of King Uzziah, this time period of peace where Uzziah had time to kind of experiment and grow the kingdom of Judah, but also would have seen the judgment on Uzziah and this transition of power, uh, which would have probably seemed a gradual transition of power to Jotham as Uzziah would have had to fade into the background because of his leprosy and Jotham would have taken on almost all of the kingly authority, just not so in May. And so at this transition between Uzziah and Jotham, Isaiah, you know, God calls him officially as a prophet. And Isaiah is going to begin as, you know, the temperature the, on the world stage is turned up on Judah. It's also going to be turned up uh, by God through Isaiah. It's a very interesting passage. You can read about this. We already have in mm -hmm. the first, second, third, or first, second Chronicles and first, second Kings. Uh, and Samuel, 1st, 2nd Samuel and all of that. But I think it's important to remember that in the prophets, you go back and you're rereading through in time-wise, time mm -hmm. but God is showing you a more detailed picture now and a closer picture of what's really happening. So I find that fast. Right, there's like a spiritual commentary yeah. that's going on. Yeah, that's right. And, mm -hmm. and again, Isaiah is an amazing prophet, right? Yeah, well, just as Corey did, I'm focusing on Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, in which the prophet declares, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of its robe filled the temple. And notice that detail about the garment. The train or the hem of our Lord's robe filled the temple. Just what is the meaning behind this image? Well, this edge of the garment concept is actually found all throughout the Bible. And so we're going to take a look at some other biblical passages to help us understand the meaning of this Isaiah passage. So let's go. In the year that King Uzziah died, declares the prophet Isaiah, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. In the ancient cultures, garments played an important role which is why Isaiah's observation concerning the Lord's robe, and specifically to the train of his robe, is especially significant. The Hebrew word for train is shul, which means hem, border, fringe, bottom edge of a skirt or train. In the ancient world, the hem or fringes of a garment represented authority. Thus to cut off the hem of one's garment was to strip that person of his authority and personality. In fact, a husband could divorce his wife by simply cutting off the hem of her robe. A nobleman could authenticate his name on a clay tablet by pressing his particular hem on a clay tablet. It was like a signature or seal. Thus, when David cut off the hem of Saul's garment, he was cutting off his genealogy that was embroidered in the hem. That was his symbol of kingship. This is why David later repented of that act against the Lord's anointed. Joseph's so-called coat of many colors was actually a seamless robe with a special hem which implied a position of privilege. When Ruth asked Boaz to put his hem over her, she was putting the claim of leveret marriage upon him, which he of course accepted. In God's covenant with Israel, he declares in Ezekiel 16:8, I will spread the edge of my garment over thee. In other words, God was putting his authority, his mantle, his protection, and his covering over Israel. In fact, according to the Mosaic law, every Jew was obliged to wear a fringe or tassel at each of the four corners of the outer garment one thread of each tassel to be deep blue. These tassels were to be to them a perpetual reminder of the law of God and of their duty to keep it. This means that Jesus, as an obedient Jew, would also have had these tassels. In fact, this was the very hem which the woman with the issue of blood wanted to touch, because conceptually that's where his authority was. Of course, Jesus also wore a seamless robe, which interestingly enough was never torn during his crucifixion perhaps signifying that his priesthood is without end. Indeed, according to the vision of Isaiah, our Lord still wears a robe in his heavenly habitation, and the train or hem of that robe fills the temple. Hence, as Jesus himself declared to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 
So the train, hem, or edge of the garment in ancient cultures represented authority. And when we come to realize this, it really brings illumination to so many different Bible passages. I mean, think about it. Genesis 37, 1 Samuel 24, Isaiah 6, Matthew 9 and 28, Ezekiel 16, and others. You know, I actually think it would be a great personal prayer if we were to ask God to spread the hem of his garment over us. Just a thought. You know, that's really interesting. And uh, when you when you pray and when you see the scripture, there's a lot of times that the prophets are praying. Mm -hmm. uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the rest of them. And uh, they, they pray and it, it's the words of the Holy Spirit really speaking through that man. Absolutely. And so that becomes very interesting. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to listen to it, you begin to pray that way, Lord, spread your garment over me. You know, and that's what Psalms tells us to pray. And it's really interesting. It really is. Uh, it's a very powerful image. Yeah, because, I mean, Lord, be king over my life. When you pray that on a regular basis, he will. He responds to you and he does that work. So that's very good, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent work. Keep the pieces coming, buddy. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Please do. Very good. Okay, Janice. Isaiah, it is a book rich with knowledge and deepens our understanding of God's nature. And uh, I also love to see Isaiah's personality coming out as well in these words. And especially here in, in chapter six of Isaiah, where he's called by God to be a prophet. And uh, that's why I titled my segment, Called to Serve. And uh, I love, I love, first of all, uh, how in the presence of God's holiness, the first thing that Isaiah felt was the weight of his own sinfulness in the holiness of God's presence. And, you know, we, we hear in verse five, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And God responds back to him. And then he hears the Lord says, in, in ask in verse 8, And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And we don't know how long there was a pause after that, but it seems very quickly that Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And I thought that was very much unlike the response that, that uh, Moses gave to God or even Jeremiah, this willingness that was in Isaiah's heart to respond to the call of God on his life. And it made me think about the call that God has on my own life, on each of our lives, how that I pray that my heart will be willing and obedient as Isaiah was here to respond to the things that God has called me to do and the way that God has called me to serve. And um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that because I tend to be somebody that will serve kind of like Martha in the Bible, where we read that she was just serving, serving, serving all the time. And she was frustrated with her sister when Jesus and some of the disciples had come over and Martha was doing all the serving and getting everything ready and frustrated with her sister because her sister spent time sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus, being taught and listening. And she asked Jesus, can't you just tell my sister to come and give me a hand? And Jesus softly rebuked Martha at that time and said that he wasn't going to always be there uh, and that, that her sister was actually choosing the wise thing to do. And so I want to remind us today, those of you that are kind of like me, that we get caught up in the tasks of things, doing things for God, that God doesn't call us to do things that take away from our relationship and with our time with him. If it's doing that, if you're serving others is taking time away from you actually spending time in his word, spending time in meditation and spending time in prayer with God, then we all need to relook at what we're doing and make God, the Lord Jesus Christ, our top priority. 
and make that relationship what it should be, what it can be, because God is with us. And as we draw near to him, James reminds us that he will draw near to us. So it's our effort. God is always there. He never sleeps. He never changes. It's us that we need to be close and we need to stay close to the Lord Jesus in order to have that great relationship with the Lord. You know, that's really good, Janice. That's really good. And the, the you want the relationship with God because God has so much to offer. And I think sometimes we, we mistaken when we are driven people, when we like to serve, and that's how we show our love. It, it's easy to get caught into the trap yeah. that the task becomes more important. God loves us for who we are. We serve God, not because we get brownie points or because that makes God love us anymore. We serve because we love God first. That's right. And when we love God first, then that is shown as a reflection into our lives. A really good passage for you to see study far, further on serving for God's glory if you read 1 Peter chapter 4 and specifically verses 7 through 11. It talks about how we need to serve others as we serve the Lord Jesus and it puts it into a really good perspective. As we conclude the program today, we come upon this idea that we think about, and that is that the Bible, what we study here, is divine wisdom, and it's from God. It's from His mind, not from ours. It's not a bunch of men writing what they want. And so we pray and we say, Lord, show me your ways and teach me your paths. I believe that your word is true, and I believe it's written by you, a divine mind. Help us, Lord, to understand it. In Jesus' wonderful and glorious name, we said together, amen.